Uh, oh. Thank you. My name is Joe Evinger, and I help organize the Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group. We were founded in 2017. Uh, my Hillary Naylor is my co-host. Uh, all of our members are, have very educational and work experience backgrounds, but we all share common interest in science and new ideas. We currently have about 48 members plus additional guests and invitees. We meet via Zoom always on the second Thursday of every month from three o'clock until about 4.30. We have a different guest speaker each month who speaks on a topic related to science and ideas. We rely on our group members, Arts and, Col Arts and Culture Committee, the Ashby, all Ashby Village members, presenters, and others for ideas about new speakers and ways to connect with them. Besides our presentation today, I'm actively in recruiting speakers who might speak to us in the coming months. Here are some of the upcoming topics. The botany of fall colors, and perhaps even a short discussion of the possibility of growing plants on Mars someday. That's in March. Out of Africa, part three, ancient human dispersals out of Africa will be our April presentation. Upcoming presentations for later in the summer and fall will include the birds in general and of Lake Merritt in particular. We're gonna have a volcanologist speak to us about volcanoes. We have a cancer researcher who will be speaking on the new frontier of viral-based cancer therapeutics. We might have an update on COVID vaccine development. We'll hear about whether or not there may be a fourth round. I have someone scheduled for the late fall who will speak to us on the new technologies. BART was among the first to implement some 50 years ago. We invite all Ashby Valley members to uh, join our group. Other interested people are also very welcome. Let me get out my notes here for I'm now going to introduce you to Gerald McKeegan. But first, let me say, Gerald will talk more about this, but as Hillary has already sent out in a chat, February 18th is National Pluto Day, an annual celebration of that celestial body's history. And yes, uh, behind me, you'll see in my background a photo of Pluto. Perhaps Gerald can tell us how this photo was taken. To Gerald McKeegan will talk to us today about Pluto, how it was discovered, how our scientific understanding of it has changed over the decades, and why the debate about Pluto's status as a planet still continues. It's, it's been enthroned as a planet, dethroned, and the discussion continues. Gerald McKeegan is an astronomer at the Chippewa Space and Science Center in Oakland, California where he also serves on the board of directors. He teaches astronomy at Chabot, hosts an online virtual telescope program of which I'm a very ardent devotee and appears frequently in broadcast in the print media discussing astronomy, space events, et cetera. He has more than 40 years experience working in the aerospace industry, primarily on spacecraft and launch vehicles, including several NASA planetary missions. Gerald holds a master's of science degree in space studies and has received numerous awards for his uh, work at uh, Chabot Observatory Asteroid Tracking Program. I encourage all of you to ask questions as Hillary mentioned at the end of the presentation. I encourage you all, by the way, to go and visit the Sabo Space and Science Center in Oakland and consider membership. Now, Gerald, we are ready for liftoff. Please take it. All right. Well, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, just to repeat what Joe said, uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center is once again open in the Oakland Hills, and we are open on the weekends. So if you want to come up and visit us during the daytime on weekends, on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, we invite you to come on up. We are also opening our observatories on Friday and Saturday nights for free public viewing. So if you just wanna come up and look through the telescopes, uh, you can join us between 7.30 and 10.30 on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, so as Joe mentioned, it's uh, coming up here pretty soon. It's going to be National 
Pluto Day. And so I wanted to just talk about the saga of Pluto and, and uh, the, you know, the controversy about uh, its, its status as a planet and so forth. So uh, bear with me for a second and I will uh, get uh, my screen share going. All right. Hopefully you can see that. There we go. Okay, so uh, a couple of images here of Pluto and its uh, its moon, sometimes considered uh, the the uh, smaller of the two bodies. The uh, we sometimes call Pluto a, a binary planet. So Pluto and its moon Charon. Uh, and I'm just going to talk about its, its history here a little bit. And we're going to start by going back to uh, the year 1780 and talk about what the uh, solar system looked like in 1780. And this is a, a model of how the solar system appeared to science in 1780. Uh, six planets and the occasional comet, then the sun, and that was pretty much it. Uh, in fact, in 1780, there was actually still some debate about whether comets were actually part of the solar system. There were some folks who felt that it was actually phenomena within our own uh, atmosphere. Uh, so this is the, 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 the model of the, the solar system that you would have seen in 1780. Uh, about that time, uh, astronomers began to realize that the spacing between the planet orbits uh, followed a mathematical uh, pattern. And that mathematical pattern became known as Bode's Law. And uh, it more or less accurately calculated the distances to each of the planets as you worked your way out from the sun. Now, it worked well for all of the planets that you see here. But if you extended that law, it predicted that there would be uh, even more planets farther out from Saturn. Uh, and so astronomers began to look for those planets. And in 1781, William Herschel discovered the planet Uranus. And Uranus was pretty much right where it was predicted to be uh, based on Bode's law. And they uh, observed it for a while, calculated its orbit, and came up with a pretty good number, but not perfect. Uh, they kept noticing that Uranus seemed to drift a little bit. It uh, didn't always show up right where we expected it based on the orbit. And there was some concern about what was going on, what might be the cause. And of course, that led to speculation. Uh, that there might be yet another planet even farther than Uranus. Uh, by the way, the name is Uranus. It's not Uranus. Uh, I know everybody likes to use that other name, but the correct name is Uranus. It's named after uh, the father of the Titans in Greek mythology. So anyway, there were discrepancies in, in the orbit of Uranus and Astronomers began to suspect that that was caused by yet another planet even farther out. And sure enough, in 1846, the planet Neptune was discovered. Uh, and when they did the calculations and, and looked at the uh, influence of Neptune, which was a pretty big planet, uh, they realized that it accounted for most of the discrepancies that they saw in the orbit of Uranus. So uh, that seemed to satisfy most of the issues, but there was still a little bit of a problem with the orbit of Uranus. And some folks were even noticing there might be a problem with the orbit of Neptune as well. So the mystery still kind of continued a little bit there. Uh, in, in uh, the, the um, early 20th century, actually the, the 1890s, uh, this guy got involved. His name was Percival Lowell. Uh, Percival Lowell was a, a businessman um, in uh, New England. 
And he was a, actually owned a business, a, a cotton mill for several years, and his family was very wealthy. He later became a diplomat, traveled to Asia, uh, spent several years in Asia, eventually wrote a couple of books about Asian culture. But uh, Lowell was very much into uh, mathematics and astronomy, and he became interested in observing the planet Mars. And being wealthy, he actually funded the construction of an observatory uh, on a hill just outside of Flagstaff, uh, Arizona. And that became known as the Lowell Observatory. Uh, he, he hired a, a staff there and uh, over time uh, it became a very active observatory ended up with a two or three uh, uh, telescopes uh, he had a uh, an employee or a colleague there named william pickering but eventually the two of them became rivals and one of the part of their rivalry had to do with uh, both of them having different ideas about the possibility of yet another planet beyond uh, Neptune that would account for the continued of, uh, perturbations that they were seeing in Uranus's orbit and also in Neptune's orbit. Uh, so Lowell, being a mathematician, he started doing uh, calculations. And in 1915, he published uh, an article in which he described the results of his calculations. He calculated the mass and the size of what he called planet X. And he even went so far as to calculate the approximate location where he thought they would find planet X. Um, and of course, this was all based on these perturbations that he saw primarily in, in the orbit of Uranus, but also uh, Neptune. <clears throat> he began searching and encouraged other astronomers at the Lowell Observatory to do the searching, but in 1916, he passed away. And so uh, the other uh, astronomers at the Lowell Observatory, they continued for a little while, but the problem with searching for a planet uh, like this, it's very tedious work, it takes a long time. And there were other more interesting things for astronomers to do. And so it didn't really get a whole lot of attention. But Lowell's wife and Lowell's brother, Lawrence Lowell, still pushed the idea uh, that the Lowell Observatory should continue the search for planet X. And in fact, in 1928, Lawrence Lowell commissioned a new telescope for that purpose. It was a 13 inch uh, telescope, um, which he wanted the observatory to use for the purpose of searching for uh, Lowell's planet X. Uh, but again, the, the other astronomers at the observatory, they, they toyed around with it a little bit, but it it you know, was long, tedious work, and they just they had other things they would rather do. Well, about that time, along came this fellow here. This is Clyde Tombaugh. Clyde Tombaugh was a Kansas farm boy and an amateur astronomer. And he built his own telescope. In fact, the one you see him with there, he built. Uh, and he was just very much interested in astronomy, although he was not professionally trained as an astronomer. In early 1928, he writes a letter to the director of the Lowell Observatory, telling him of his interest in astronomy and describing some of the work he's done as an amateur and asking for a job. And he tells him, he says, I'll do anything. Just I want to work at the observatory, so I'll do anything. I'll even sweep the floors if that's what you need. Uh, so uh, the director of Lowell decides to hire Clyde Tomba. And among his first duties was, in fact, sweeping the floors. Uh, but after a while, they realized this is the ideal guy to to take up that search for Planet X uh, because nobody else wanted to do it. So Clyde Tombaugh was assigned to uh, 
work with the 13 inch low uh, telescope to uh, search for planet X. Of course, that meant now he had a, he had a real job. So he uh, had a little money to spend. And one of the things he did is went out and bought himself a decent suit and uh, got himself photographed uh, next to the, one of the telescopes looking like a real serious astronomer. So the telescope he used was a 13 inch telescope designed specifically for this purpose. And we call it a telescope, but the more appropriate name for it is what's called an astrograph. An astrograph is a telescope that's been optimized specifically for photography rather than looking through with your eye. Uh, this is a photograph of the actual uh, telescope that he used. It is still at the Lowell Observatory. Um, in fact, they now call it the Pluto Telescope. Uh, but it was originally commissioned by Lowell's brother, Lawrence, and was known as the Lowell Astrograph. And this is a picture that I took uh, when I visited the Lowell Observatory here uh, more than 10 years ago. That's my daughter, Jamie, standing there. She was only 13 at the time we took this picture. She's going to have her 28th birthday next month. So that gives you an idea how long ago this picture was taken. But one of the things you notice, um, I'm, I'm hoping you can see my cursor here. You see this square or rectangular shaped uh, panel on the back end of the telescope. This telescope was really more of a camera than a telescope. And this is where uh, photographic plates were inserted into this uh, framework here. And then Lowell would take long exposure photographs of the night sky in the area where, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, Clyde Tomba would take these long exposures of the night sky in the area where Lowell had predicted. And he would put a, a photographic plate in the frame, open the shutters, uh, open the front end of the telescope and take exposures that would be sometimes several hours long. And he did this night after night, whenever the weather was good, he would take these pictures and he would take a picture of a certain part of the sky, then move to the next part of the sky, take another picture and then do, move to the next one and just do this over and over again. And the important thing was that he would uh, repeat these images every few days. Uh, the motion of the presumed planet X would have caused it to shift position over a period of three or four days. Uh, so it was important that you take a picture today and then you come back again, say in a week and take another picture and then compare those pictures to try to find the, the planet. So that's what he did. And he did this for a year or actually for about nine months, almost a year. And he took hundreds of images like this, very, very tedious work, uh, not only taking the images on the, on the uh, telescope, but then he had to develop them. And he actually came up with some techniques for optimizing that whole process. And, and then he had to analyze in them. And, and usually he would take the one picture one day, a week later, take another picture, and then a a few days later or a week or so later, he would then analyze them. And the way he analyzed them was to use this device that you see, see here. It's called a blink comparator. And the way it works is you have two frames on the comparator. You would take two images of the same part of the sky, mount one on each frame. And then there was an eyepiece and mirror mechanism in the center. And this would allow you to look at either one image or the other, or look at both at the same time by looking through the eyepiece. And what you did is you initially looked at both images through the eyepiece, and then you adjusted the, the frames holding the images until all the stars in both images lined up with each other. So even though you were looking at two images, you, it would actually appear as though you were looking at one image. And once you had them aligned like this, you then there's the little knob up here at the top, you would flip it back and forth so that the mirrors would show you one image and then the other. And you would sort of blink back and forth between the two images. And if there was anything that changed position from one image to the next, your eye would quickly pick up on that. 
And so he did this, like I say, for, for nearly a year, uh, took a lot of patience, but uh, it did pay off. Uh, on February 18th, he looked at two images, one taken on the 23rd of January and another one taken on the 29th of January, put them in the blank comparator. And sure enough, he spotted uh, an object that was moving at the right speed, which indicated that it was at the right distance uh, to be potentially his planet X. So you see these two separate images here. It's There's some arrows there pointing it out, but you don't really get a sense from this of what he was looking at. So I put together a little animation here. So these are the two images uh, blinking back and forth between the two of them. And this is what he would do on the blink comparator. Now the two images had slightly different exposure times and were done under slightly different uh, sky conditions. So there's a lot of stuff that appears in one that doesn't appear in another. But the important thing is right in the middle here where you see these two circles. And if you watch, you'll see that there's a dot that appears in one and then it appears in the other. And they don't, they aren't in the same image. They're one jumps, it seems to jump from one image to the next. And that is Pluto. Uh, now, at the time, they didn't call it Pluto. Uh, like I say, this was done on February 18th. He then reported it to uh, the director of the observatory. Uh, they then contacted the Harvard College Observatory and asked them to do some verification of it. And they did. And in early March, uh, they announced to the world that a new planet had been discovered pretty much right where uh, Percival Lowell said it would be. And, uh, you know, got quite a, quite a bit of press, a lot of excitement, uh, so much so that uh, uh, Clyde Tombaugh became concerned that, you know, they needed to come up with a name before somebody else did. And so he, he pushed the, uh, the director of the observatory to come up with a name, use some technique for coming up with a name for this new planet. So they sponsored a contest and got more than a thousand suggestions for what the name should be. In England, in Oxford, England, uh, there was a 11 year old girl named Venetia Burney, and she was very much into mythology. And she suggested to her grandfather that the planet should be named after the Roman god of the underworld, Pluto. Uh, her grandfather happened to be friends with a prominent English uh, astronomer. And so her grandfather told the astronomer about it, who then contacted the director at the Lowell Observatory. Uh, and they decided that would be the name. So the planet became Pluto. Now, a little aside here, as a lot of you know, there's a cartoon character, a Disney cartoon character, also named Pluto. And some people are a little confused about which one came first. And it was the name of the planet that came first. Pluto was a cartoon character developed by uh, the Disney animators. The first cartoon he appeared in, he actually was had a different name. Uh, but after the discovery of Pluto, uh, actually a couple of years afterwards, is when they started calling the cartoon character, the little dog, they called him Pluto. And so the planet came first and then the, the dog. More about that later. Uh, so Pluto was discovered, lots of fanfare about uh, the new new uh, planet. Of course, that meant you had to rewrite textbooks and everything instead of saying eight planets. Now it was nine planets. Uh, but there were problems. And there were actually several problems. I'm just going to review a couple of them here. One of the problems that I had was, remember how I said that Percival Lowell had calculated the size and the mass of what he thought uh, the planet X should look like? Well, it didn't conform very well to what they actually discovered. For one thing, the planet that Clyde Tombaugh saw was much too faint, uh, you know, for the planet to have the mass that Clyde Tombaugh, uh, or rather Percival Lowell, calculated. It should have been 
pretty big and should have been pretty bright. Uh, so the fact that it was so faint suggested that it was much smaller than what uh, Percival Lowell had calculated. Now, there might be an explanation if for some reason the surface of the planet was much darker than any other planet in the solar system. That might account for why it's so faint. But uh, more likely, the, the reason was it was just a lot smaller than he calculated, which posed the question, was this really the, the planet responsible for uh, the perturbations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune? Another thing that was unusual was the orbit of Pluto itself. Once they observed it for a while, they were able to calculate its orbit, and there it, was, it was definitely a weird orbit. If you look at the orbits of the planets around, sun, the, around the Sun, the other eight planets, they all are pretty much in the same orbital plane. So they all orbit pretty much parallel to the Earth's orbit. In fact, the Earth's orbit defines a uh, orbital plane we call the ecliptic, and all the other planets orbit very close to the ecliptic. But it turns out Pluto did not. In fact, Pluto had a really weird orbit. It was inclined about 17 degrees to the ecliptic, uh, which was strange in itself. The other thing is most or the other planets all had pretty much circular orbits. They were slightly elliptical, uh, but uh, pretty close to being circular. Pluto's orbit was not uh, circular. It was very elliptical, so much so that part of the time in Pluto's orbit around the sun, it takes 248 years for it to orbit around the sun, and part of that time it actually is closer to the sun than Neptune. So that really presented a problem of, uh, you know, how does it affect Neptune? How can it affect Uranus when it's so tipped so much and so forth? Uh, so there were a lot of difficulties associated with that. And that, that resulted in quite a bit of debate about whether Pluto really was the planet that accounted for the perturbations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And in fact, whether Pluto was actually a planet at all. Um, this is just an example of some of the debate that went on uh, over the years. And I won't read all of these to you, uh, but you know, there were questions about whether uh, the discovery was, was just an accident rather than actually a, being a real planet where Lowell had, had predicted it to be. Uh, there were just uh, debates about the nature of Pluto, whether it was truly a planet or whether it was possibly an object that came from somewhere else. And several astronomers did some calculations that suggested that Pluto was actually a former satellite of the planet Neptune. Uh, and that somehow it had an interaction with one of the other moons of uh, Neptune, Triton, and that that caused the moon to or that moon to be ejected, and it became what we call the planet uh, Pluto, uh, and so forth. There's a, a lot of different uh, astronomers over the years, for decades, literally were debating the nature of Pluto, whether or not we should call it a planet, whether it originated where we see it now or whether it came from somewhere else and so forth. One of the things I want to call your attention to, though, is this item right here. In the 1940s, uh, two astronomers uh, in 1943, Kenneth Ed Edgeworth and in 1949, uh, Gerard Kuiper, both suggested independently that their analysis of the structure of the solar system told them that there should be more objects beyond Neptune in orbits pretty much along the ecliptic as well. And that they, these objects ought to be icy bodies and that they would be the source of what were called short period comets. Now, Kenneth Edwards was the first to suggest this, but he was not a very prominent uh, astronomer. He was um, 
a little more than an amateur astronomer. But uh, Gerard Kuiper was a well-known professional astronomer. And so eventually this region of the solar system became known as the Kuiper belt. Uh, some astronomers still call it the Edgeworth Kuiper belt, but most people call it the Kuiper belt. And the Kuiper belt is a region beyond Neptune, where uh, astronomers believe there would be many, many icy bodies orbiting around the sun, and that this was the source of these short period comets. Now, a short period comet is a comet that orbits the sun in less than 200 years. Halley's Comet is a good example. Uh, there are several other comets, Ankies, and so forth, that are comets that have short periods, uh, less than 200 years, and they have a, a couple of characteristics. They often orbit very close to the ecliptic and so forth. And so this kind of tied together this notion that there was this reservoir of these icy bodies out there beyond Neptune, which became known as the uh, Kuiper Belt. And this was all theoretical. Again, it, it uh, you know, was first proposed in the 1940s. Uh, in the decades afterwards, uh, many more astronomers took up the idea did calculations, plotted the orbits of comets and so on. And it uh, seemed to be a pretty good theory, but there was no one who had actually seen anything other than maybe Pluto, which Pluto at first didn't seem to be a very good uh, candidate for a Kuiper Belt object. But then in 1992, uh, two astronomers, uh, Dave Jewett and Jane Liu uh, at the University of Hawaii uh, were testing some new technology. They were among the first to use a CCD camera instead of a film camera on a telescope. And they began surveying the sky. And sure enough, they discovered an object which became designated as 1992 QB1. Uh, Jewett and Liu nicknamed it Smiley, although it, it now has a, a, a different name, but originally they called it Smiley. Uh, and their calculations showed it was right out there in the region that uh, would have made it a, a Kuiper Belt object. And so that was the first clear-cut evidence that there indeed was this reservoir of bodies out there, just as had been predicted, um, called the Kuiper Belt. In very short order, more objects were discovered. In fact, by the late 1990s, there were nearly 200 known Kuiper Belt objects. And as they uh, discovered these objects and calculated the orbits, they began to notice a pattern that there were several of these objects that were in orbits very similar to Pluto. In fact, some of them were roughly the same distance away. And in fact, some of them even seemed to be very close to the same size as Pluto. Uh, and that became a concern to astronomers that uh, maybe there was uh, a, a problem with calling Pluto a planet. Maybe it was just part of the uh, uh, Kuiper belt. And as they discovered more of these objects, it became more and more difficult to decide what to do. And this is just an example of some of the objects that were discovered out there and their current names. Uh, these are all objects similar in size or very close in size to Pluto. In fact, Eris may be slightly larger than Pluto. And all these objects were discovered in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. And this created a real problem for astronomers because either they decided to call all of these objects planets or they decided to come up with some new category, in which case Pluto would be part of that new category and not a planet. And this was a very difficult thing for astronomers. And there was a lot of debate and a lot of disagreement about what should be done and, and what approach should be taken. Well, one astronomer decided to uh, move forward with his own ideas about that. 
that was Neil deGrasse Tyson. And Neil deGrasse Tyson was at the Rose Center for Earth and Science, uh, part of the, or, or of which uh, is the Hayden uh, Planetarium. And in the year 2000, they built a new exhibit, a large exhibit area. And one of the features was uh, a number of planets suspended from the ceiling, very large models of planets suspended from the ceiling. It was very interesting, very fascinating, very dramatic when you went in there and saw it. But there was no Pluto in this model. And that became very controversial. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson took a lot of criticism from the astronomy community because he basically jumped the gun. Um, and so a lot of debate, this, this accelerated the debate. Um, uh, astronomers kind of divided themselves into two camps, those who believed Pluto should continue to be called a planet and those who believe that no, it should be some other category, just another Kuiper Belt object. And this raged on and on for several years. Finally, in the year 2006, the International Astronomical Union had their uh, General Assembly in Prague. And this was one of the main topics of discussion at this uh, General Assembly is whether or not they should uh, come up with a new category of, of objects and demote Pluto to that new category. And the debate was hot and heavy. It went on for several days. Eventually, the decision was made to uh, form a committee which would come up with a proposed alternate definition of the word planet. Uh, they, they worked at this and literally on the last day of this convention, uh, almost at the last hour, this new, the committee's new definition of the word planet was submitted to the remaining delegates. Some of them had already gone home. Um, they voted to adopt a new definition. Uh, a lot of them just said, I'm sick of this. I just want to get it over with. So they went ahead and voted, even though they had still had reservations and still had issues with that new de uh, definition. But as a result, in August of 2006, Pluto was no longer a planet. It now fell into a new category called dwarf planet. Not a popular decision. And it created a little problem for NASA because in 2006, earlier in 2006, NASA had orbited or launched a new mission called New Horizons. And New Horizons was launched in early 2006 with the objective of going out and surveying the planet Pluto. And if you were to read the literature describing this mission that was put out by NASA in early 2006, it all refers to the planet Pluto. So now NASA, NASA was kind of caught in an awkward position because after launching this mission, the IAU gets together and says, okay, Pluto is no longer a planet. But the spacecraft was on its way and it took nine years to get there, but in 2015, it arrived at Pluto and began to survey it. Uh, initially, as it approached Pluto, um, it was just a little dot uh, in the distance. And so if you look up here, you can see Pluto. Pluto has a large moon called Charon, and you can see it right here. And that moon is actually very large compared to the size of the planet. And we knew about that before we launched uh, New Horizons. Um, Charon uh, is compared to all the other planets of the solar system. It's the largest moon compared to the size of its parent body. As New Horizons got closer to Pluto, we got better and better images and more and more detail began to uh, reveal itself. And so here's Pluto, here's Charon. But one of the things they realized is Pluto was a lot more complex looking than was expected of 
what should have been just an ordinary Kuiper Belt object. And in fact, as uh, New Horizons got closer to the planet, it would not go into orbit around the planet, it would just fly by. But it was taking lots of pictures as it got closer and closer to the planet, and more and more detail was coming out. And Pluto's surface was completely different than what they were expecting to see. For one thing, there aren't very many craters. Pluto's surface didn't show a lot of craters, which suggested that it was somehow geologically active. Uh, as they got closer yet, they saw all these features, what looked like cryovolcanoes, what looked like seas of slushy ice that seemed to be moving around, um, and um, canyons and valleys. It even it turned out that Pluto had an atmosphere, which you can get a little hint of here. And so this started to create a lot more controversy because Pluto was looking to be a very complex place, much more so than what they were expecting. There were, in fact, a few craters, which is what they expected. They expected to see lots of craters, kind of like the moon or Mercury. Uh, and although they saw a few craters, they saw a lot of regions where there were no craters at all. And the only way that could be so is if there was some sort of process that was constantly reworking the surface of Pluto. And as they studied these images, they began to realize that there was actually kind of an ocean of slushy, nitrogen ice that was flowing and, and ebbing and and re, redoing the surface. And that's why uh, we, you didn't see very many craters. So this uh, really excited astronomers on one hand, but it began to uh, create problems for this idea that Pluto was not a planet. It was just another Kuiper Belt object. You know, just an example, they saw dunes on Pluto, which suggested winds were blowing and there was something like sand. It was actually ice particles uh, and, and huge cracks suggesting some sort of internal workings that was going on. And so the result of this mission was that the our, our view of Pluto became suddenly much more complicated. And that brought into question Again, the idea that Pluto was maybe ought to be considered a planet. Um, and of course, one of the most interesting things was Pluto had an atmosphere. Pluto's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, but it also contains methane, carbon dioxide, and even a little bit of oxygen. In fact, compositionally, it's very similar to what the Earth's atmosphere would have been like very early when the Earth first formed. So this just uh, increased uh, the controversy about the, the nature of Pluto. Um, they began to form a new model of what Pluto was like. They realized it had a rocky interior core that was surrounded by water ice, which was then surrounded by a thick layer of frozen nitrogen, <clears throat> which was subject to geological processes and even things like uh, what were called cryovolcanoes, which is like an ice volcano. They realized also that the atmosphere was changing over time. When Pluto was closer to the sun, remember how I said there is a period of time when it's actually closer to the sun than Neptune and other periods when it's much farther away from the sun. And what they realized is that the atmosphere changed depending on how far it was from the sun. When it was close to the sun, some of the nit frozen nitrogen would evaporate or sublimate and uh, increase the density of the atmosphere. And then when it got farther away, a lot of that nitrogen would freeze out again. And so the atmosphere would get thinner. So here we had a model of a much more complicated uh, object than was anticipated um, and much more like other planets. And so the controversy has continued. So even today, although we are still officially saying Pluto is not a planet, 
there's still a lot of debate among astronomers and other scientists. Um, and the debate continues to rage over whether we should consider Pluto a planet, as Percival Lowell and Clyde Tomba argued, or whether we should consider it a Kuiper Belt object uh, or a dwarf planet like the International Astronomical Union uh, proposed in 2006. And so, you know, it's kind of up to us to kind of, you know, think in our own mind what it should be. Uh, my personal feeling is it is a dwarf planet. A dwarf planet, though, is just another uh, class of planets. So, yes, it is a planet. In fact, uh, we have a, a, a group of uh, planet categories. There's what we call terrestrial planets like uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the giant planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, the dwarf planets, Pluto, and Ceres, and Eris, and so forth. And then there are the minor planets. We classify asteroids and comets as minor planets. So you have these four categories, all of which have one word in common, and that's the word planet. So when people ask me, you know, what are they? Is Pluto a planet or not? I say, yes, it is. It's a dwarf planet. Uh, but I'll leave it up to you to make up your own minds. I want to leave you with two more slides here. Uh, the first one is one I call the incredible shrinking planet. Actually, I guess I should call it the incredible shrinking dwarf planet. Um, when Percival Lowell first did his calculations back in 1915, he came up with a size of the planet of 24,000 kilometers. That would have was his estimate of the diameter of the planet. Um, he also calculated it, that it had seven times the mass of the Earth. So in his mind, it would be a very big planet. Well, obviously, that turned out not to be the case. Once Pluto was discovered uh, and they saw that it was much fainter than uh, was in, anticipated, astronomers, astronomers began to recalculate the size and they came up with about 8,000 kilometers, which still made it bigger than the planet Mars. Uh, and that was the number that was in effect for quite a long time. Uh, it got tweaked a little bit, revised a little bit. In 1971, the Air Force Academy came out with a new textbook called The Fundamentals of Astrodynamics. And it gave the size of 7,016 kilometers. Uh, in 1979, the new edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica was published, and it listed the size as 6,760 kilometers, which would make it about the same size as Mars. Uh, in the 1990s, the Hubble Space Telescope took a number of uh, very high quality images of Pluto. And based on those images, astronomers came up with an estimate of about 2,300 kilometers, which would make it smaller than Earth's moon. And of course, um, in 2015, the New Horizons uh, spacecraft flew by, got a very accurate uh, measurement of the size, and that 2300 number turned out to be pretty accurate. Uh, it, uh, New Horizons came up with the uh, size of 2376 kilometers. So over the decades, Pluto has gotten smaller and smaller. Uh, it's now considered a dwarf planet. I wanted to leave you with one other image, and that's one that uh, Joe had in his background, and I've shown it here. Remember how we talked about Pluto, the name, and how Pluto uh, was named after the god of the underworld, uh, but not long afterwards, Disney's dog became known as Pluto, and over the years, a lot of controversy came up about which name came first, the dog or the planet, and so forth. Well, Mother Nature had the last laugh. Um, as people saw this image, a lot of people looked at this image, and they said, well, Mother Nature is showing us the truth, because if you look at this image long enough, you see... Uh, Pluto. 
on the image. So you'll never again look at this image and not see the little dog Pluto on Pluto. All right. So that's my presentation. I guess now would be a good time for me to take questions. I'm not sure how you guys want to handle this, whether you want to just have people put up their hand or, or how we should do it. Sure, hands are good. Hands are good. Well, let me start out uh, it, with the last one of the last slides you showed. How could the discrepancy be so different on the kilometers of Jupiter between 70s technology and what Hubble showed? I mean, it was a factor of three difference almost. Right, right. Um, when you look at images taken with telescopes back in the 1960s and 50s and 40s and so on, they're, they show the planet as being not much more than a, a fuzzy dot. Um, and so it's extremely hard to measure sizes of what what is basically a fuzzy dot. It wasn't until the Hubble Space Telescope was able to get pictures with enough resolution where you could actually see it as a round ball and you could see some features on it and you could measure its angular size and knowing its distance, you could actually estimate uh, uh, its size. Prior to that, it was just, uh, you know, the, the technique that they would use is with a device called a, 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 a phylarm micrometer. Uh, you had this little tiny fuzzy disc in your image and it was not a sharp image at all. It was just a little fuzzy disc. And you would move these two wires until you contacted either size of it and then based on the angular size represented by that spacing you would calculate a size and it just it wasn't a very good technique that they that was available to them uh back in the 60s and even in the 70s and so uh you know that's what accounted for the these size differences that you see and of course uh percival lowell was doing con uh, calculations based on the perturbations of the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. It actually turned out that the perturbations that they were measuring in Neptune's orbit were not real. It's just a, an error from the way they were observing back in the you know 19th century. Um, so uh, Percival Lowell came up with this huge mass, seven times the mass of the Earth. And when he looked at, he made some assumptions about what the surface of the planet would look like, uh, and then did the math and how big it did it have to be in order to hold seven times the mass, he came up with that huge number of 24,000 kilometers. So, uh, you know, it just it took that long for them to come up with a technique and a telescope uh, that was accurate enough to come up with a reasonably good estimate of the size. Thank you. I, I just had a, a, a question for you about um, some, some, I was meeting with some friends last night and uh, the prompt for our icebreaker was snow. So, and I was showing off my new backdrop and telling them, you know, this is the view from Pluto. And so I rather flippantly said, but I don't think there's any snow here. But apparently I was not quite right about that. That's right. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So can, can you explain that a bit? Because I think right. I didn't quite follow. Right. Well, remember I said how um, Pluto is in a very elliptical orbit. So part of that orbit, it actually comes into closer to the sun than Neptune. Part of the orbit, it's much farther away. Uh, its average distance is about 39.2 times farther from the sun than the Earth is. It's very cold out there. And the nitrogen atmosphere of Pluto, when it's in close to uh, the sun, closer to the sun, it's a thicker atmosphere. But as it uh, works its way out to the point where it's farthest from the sun, it gets colder and colder. And a lot of the nitrogen in the atmosphere freezes out. And as it freezes out, it can actually fall as ice onto the surface, snow. 
right? So that's what they mean when, when they say it, there could be snow on Pluto as the nitrogen in the atmosphere freezes out and drops to the surface. Great. Thank you. Right. Uh, Jim, I think you had a question there. Yeah, I've got several, actually. But one, I've heard that there is a potentially a heat source in Pluto. And I was wondering if there's any further research on that and what what the ideas of the source of it could be. In, in the, one of the last slides I showed you, you saw that it has a rocky core. And uh, the presumption is that some of uh, that core, that rocky core, includes radioactive minerals, just like the Earth's rocky core has radioactive minerals. And that radioactive decay can uh, produce heat that uh, uh, would account for what you're talking about. I don't know that there's been a lot of research on that. That's just a theory. Uh, you know, we would really have to go back to Pluto again and do a lot more work on it. But based on the, the limited data that they were able to get as, as uh, the New Horizons spacecraft flew by the planet and uh, measured its gravitational field, uh, that was part of that theory for uh, the, the inner core of the planet. I think Sarah had a question. Okay. First of all, your, your um, enthusiasm for Pluto is, is quite contagious and we really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the moon. Is, the, is Pluto's moon then made of the same cheese as Pluto or <laughs> is it? Um, is it a different flavor of ice cream or? It, it's more rocky, okay. um, but it has a lot of the same characteristics. It's just smaller. Uh, and it, actually, Pluto has five moons, believe it or not. Oh, cool. Uh -huh. uh, but the one that's easiest to spot that we were able to spot from Earth uh, with, with the greatest ease is Charon. And that's the really big moon. Uh, in fact, it's so big that the two orbit each other, not like this, but like this. Oh, so, wow. So a lot of astronomers refer to it as a binary system, uh, literally two objects orbiting around each other. Uh, but there are three other or four other much smaller moons, uh, quite a bit smaller. One's called Nix, and I forget the names of all of them, but uh, they are much smaller and they're primarily icy bodies. Thank you. All right. Jim, did you have further question? Of course. So I was wondering if, if Bode's formula is, is balanced now with the advent of new telescopes or if there's still questions about further objects in the Kuiper belt. Um, well, first of all, um, Bode's uh, formula actually did not predict Neptune. That was a kind of a a problem because it showed up where it wasn't expected based on Bode's formula. However, Pluto does fall where we would expect it from Bode's, uh, it's Boda rather than Bode, uh, uh, from, from his formula. Uh, and it certainly does predict uh, with less and less certainty that there should be other objects even farther away. We now know that the uh, Kuiper belt is a very wide uh, region and it actually extends from about uh, 35 or so astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance, but average distance between the sun and the earth. So 35 times farther from the uh, the sun and the earth is about where the inner edge of the Kuiper belt is. And the outer edge, there's a lot of debate about where it is. It may be more than a hundred times farther than the earth and for, is from the sun. Um, and there's uh, yet another planet that is suspected of being out there, although it does not appear to follow Boda's uh, uh, formula. A lot of astronomers still debate whether that formula is actually a real formula because nobody can quite come up with a reason why it should work. Uh, 
So, you know, it's it's interesting that so many things did more or less follow Boda's uh, calculation, but why is still a matter of some conjecture. You know? uh, but there is a another planet. Uh, the the team that has pushed this idea most strongly is led by Mike Brown down at Caltech. Um, and he insists on calling it Planet Nine. Uh, the rest of us tend to call it Planet X um, because you know there's still this debate about what Planet Nine really is. Um, and and his calculation is based on um, the orbits of some of the more recently discovered Kuiper Belt objects, what we call the ex extended disk objects. And these are Kuiper Belt objects that are in highly elliptical orbits, very far, they go very far away, you know, in some cases, 80, 90 times farther from the sun than the earth. Um, and they're the long axis of these ellipses tend to all point in the same quadrant, if you will, of the solar system. They're not all pointed or all, all lined up, but they're all canted in one direction uh, relative to the, the solar system. And that suggests that there is yet another body even farther out there that is orbiting the sun and its gravitational pull is causing these uh, uh, scattered disk objects to preferentially tilt in, if you will, in that direction. Um, there's, they, they've, they've done a lot of ca calculations coming up with this idea. They've even calculated approximately where they think it is, uh, but as yet they have not discovered it. If it's real, and if their calculations are correct, this is an object that could be four times the diameter of the Earth. So it would be a pretty big object. Uh, but like I say, they have yet to find it. And not everybody agrees that that's the uh, explanation for the, the uh, pattern of these orbits that, that we're talking about. So a, a follow on is, is Pluto an extraterrestrial body that just got captured by our sun or is it something that coalesced in the Kuiper belt and somehow got knocked into that elliptical orbit? Well, the current theory is that the Kuiper belt itself, which consists of a lot of bodies, many of which are also in inclined orbits very similar to Pluto's, uh, these are icy bodies and because of their proximity to Neptune, uh, Neptune can actually perturb the orbits of these objects. So rather than Pluto perturbing Neptune's orbit, it turns out it's Neptune that perturbed Pluto's orbit. Um, and these bodies are in what are, is called a three two mean motion resonance uh, with Neptune. And that means that it takes Neptune three orbits around, or make Neptune makes three orbits around the sun for every two orbits of Pluto and Eris and some of these other bodies that are in that uh, resonous region. So it, it actually turns out that there are several bodies out there that uh, have orbits very similar to Pluto's. They're inclined and that those inclinations and the highly elliptical nature of them is because of perturbations from the gravity of Neptune. So will that resonance eventually lead to a collision between some of it, these objects? It, and it can. Form and, a bigger and, Neptune? Uh, well, that's a possibility. More likely what's going to happen is the collision will cause one or more uh, um, Kuiper Belt objects to fall out of their orbit and enter the inner solar system. And we see them as comets, what we call short period comets. So that's, that's the current uh, uh, consensus among astronomers. It's just a huge uh, reservoir of icy bodies left over from when the solar system formed. Uh, they're so far away that they, they condensed into these icy bodies, but never really coalesced into a full-size planet. Uh, and some of them that were the right distance from the sun actually are perturbed by uh, Neptune's uh, gravity, and Pluto is one of them. <laughs>
So, so you mentioned uh, comets, and can you expound a little bit on the difference between them, the Kuiper Belt and the Oort cloud? Sure, sure. So the Kuiper Belt is a a region beyond Neptune, where all of the icy bodies out there orbit around the sun in the same direction and more or less close to the ecliptic. Remember I said the ecliptic is the plane of the Earth's orbit and all the other planets orbit pretty much on the same plane. And even though Pluto is, its orbit is tilted and some of these other objects have tilted orbits relative to the ecliptic, they're still pretty close to the ecliptic and they're all orbiting the sun in the same direction. So those are the objects we call the Kuiper belt. Much farther um, going from, you know, 40 or 50 uh, astronomical unions or units, if you go out a thousand astronomical units or 20,000 astronomical units, there is a region we call the Oort cloud. Another reservoir of icy bodies, but their orbits are very different. They don't orbit in uh, anywhere close to the ecliptic. They orbit in all different directions. And uh, unlike the Kuiper Belt objects, which all orbit the sun in the same direction as the Earth, the uh, Oort cloud objects can orbit in any direction. So they're going in any which way. And they're much, much, much farther away. So if you can imagine uh, you were to map the solar system close in, you would map all of the, the, the planets uh, pretty much in the same plane. As you get farther away, it sort of fans out a little bit, but still close to that same plane. And then if you get all the way out to where the Oort cloud is, instead of uh, a torus of, of objects orbiting around the, uh, the sun, you have a spherical cloud of objects orbiting around the sun going in all different directions. And comets that originate from the Oort cloud have very, very long orbits. Their orbits can last tens of thousands of years. Um, so uh, very much a different, we call them long period of period comets, and they distinguish themselves because they can come in from any direction, whereas the short period Kuiper Belt type comets all come from roughly the region uh, where the, the Kuiper Belt is close to the uh, ecliptical plane. You might as well then explain the difference then between a, a, uh, a planet or a dwarf planet and a comet, other than a tail. Well, a comet is an icy body. They are very small and very irregular in shape. One of the, uh, the things that distinguishes a dwarf planet is that it's a body that has enough mass to where its gravity has pulled it more or less into a spherical shape. Uh, most of the comets don't have spherical shapes at all. They can have all kinds of, you know, they'll be shaped like a potato. Uh, if you remember several years ago, the European Space Agency sent a, a probe to a comet uh, that had a very funny, funny name. And that comet, when they got up close to it, it looked like um, the, a rubber ducky. And, and so there were a lot of... Uh, you know, comments about how it looked like a rubber ducky out in space. Very irregular shape. It actually seemed to have two lobes to it. Uh, so, so icy bodies with, uh, you know, irregular shapes, uh, much smaller, typically only two to five kilometers across. And as they come in close to the sun, the, the ice uh, sublimates, changes from a solid to a gas, producing a tail. Uh, there's um, a little bit of dirt and sand and gravel and a few rocks embedded within the ice. And as the ice sublimates, it releases that material and forms a particle tail. Um, and if we happen to pass through the particle tail, we see them as a, a meteor shower. So, so icy bodies coming in from the Oort cloud or coming in from the, uh, 
uh, Kuiper Belt, those are the comets. And they don't qualify as a dwarf planet because they're much too small in mass. They cannot form themselves into nice uh, spherical bodies. Thank you. Uh, more questions from anyone? One last look around. Well, Gerald, I'd like to thank you very much Come, for your welcome. second appearance to us <laughs> the last two years. We do not take that for granted and really appreciate it and look forward to maybe enticing you or one of your comrades to come again. Thank All you. Right. Again. Well, I'm sure we can do that. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. All right.